growing up when I did, a hat was always part of what you wore. I mean, I wore a schoolboy's cap, we wore a boater at school in the summer. You know, my mother wore a hat to church, my grandmother wore a hat every day, my father in the 60s wore a bowler to the city. But as far as creating our own hats, that was never an ambition. So punk for me was really, really important. Um, I became a punk in 1975, 1976, um, at High Wycombe College of Art, where I was doing my foundation. That was one of the Sex Pistols' very first gigs. Um, and then when I came to London, you know, punk was, on my first day at St. Martin's, I went into this room, and there were a whole load of girls in beige, cashmere, I think, on one side, and they were very chic and elegant and, uh, and very London. And then on the other side of the room, there was a whole sort of group of probably what my mother would have called was dropouts. Um, I thought they looked fantastic. And the, literally was, should I turn left or should I turn right? And I turned towards the punks. And um, there was a girl there called Sham, um, and she was wearing the most fantastic outfit I think I've ever seen in my life which was her father's black tuxedo with a white shirt and um, short spiky hair and men's shoes. And hanging out of her lapel here was a tampon. <laughs> and it was genius. And it was probably the most confrontational thing I have or uh, seen in my life. It was just so funny. Um, so I went and I, I hung out with them and, uh, and, and was a punk and a punk sensibility. But, you know, if you, in a funny way, if you, I feel as if you had a brain then, you couldn't be anything but a punk. You had to reject everything that went before in order to create something new. Um, we didn't want our parents' world. When I left college, it was quite strange because I'd been doing women's fashion at St. Martin's School of Art, but people were much more interested in hats. And I started to make hats for my friends, and my friends were all these people who went out to clubs. And in fact, before they were famous, it was the people from Spando Ballet, Duran Duran, Boy George, all of these people. Um, my friends and I made hats for them. Um, my first paying customer was Steve Strange. When I started off, when I had my first little shop in Covent Garden, I was seeing private clients and making hats for them, and it was wonderful to have that relationship. But also I'd met Jasper Conran and Sandra Rhodes, and they invited me to make hats for their shows. And this was a very different way of working, and it was a very different brief. Um, but I'd always thought of myself as being very European or sort of a world citizen. I hated the idea of being pigeonholed as a British person. So I went off to Paris as fast as my little legs could take me and started to work with Jean-Paul Gaultier and John Galliano and all those people, um, and still do. And, you know, I've worked with Dior actually for 20 years now, and I work in America. Every season is a new brief. That's the thing about fashion, as Oscar Wilde said, fashion's the thing so ridiculous it has to reinvent itself every six months. A brief from a designer can be, I found this hat on holiday, I'd love to have something like this, or it could be, Blue, I'm thinking a lot about blue this season, and air. So I'd like hats to look like air, please. Or they would, might say, there is no brief. Or they might say, oh, what do you think, Stephen? So you have to be on your toes all the time. Um, and when sometimes, like John Galliano, for example, will tell a whole story. So it's Empress, blah, blah, and she's escaping from Russia, and on the way, from Russia, when she gets to the border, she goes into this bar and goes into a cocktail party. And then she falls through a hole in the floor and she's in Abyssinia in the 14th century. Of course, if you're working with the celebrity, whether it's Rihanna or Beyonce or Kylie or Madonna, um, it's again a very different thing because that's something for performance. And so it's not only the performer who makes that decision. So you have the choreographer and the lighting designer and the stage director and maybe the musicians, as well as the artists who want to interpret their song. But it's always a combination of different people. So, uh, and if I'm making a hat for a film as well, it's the same thing. But essentially, even though you have all those opinions going on, the most important thing is I have to say to the performer, how do you want to feel? How do you want to be? I know how they all have their own specific requests, but do you want to feel exciting? Do you want to feel beautiful? Do you want to feel demure? 
Do you want to feel romantic? Do you want to feel aggressive? Do you want to feel number one? You know, they're all different things that, that can be built into a hat. Um, because a hat's often about, even for somebody like Rihanna, it's all about the person that you want to be, not the person that you are. You know, hats are like fashion, actually, but hats even more so. This is a fantastic costume. I'm designing hats in my head all the time, just sometimes I write them down. But really what I do is I live my life and put it into a hat. I mean, that's what you do as a designer. That's, you, you take your experience and it sort of goes around in there and travels down your arm and pops out of your finger, either drawing on a piece of paper or drawing on your iPad or phone or whatever. And I, I, I do all that. I mean, I, it's so funny. People say to me, do you use technology to make hats with? No, I don't in a funny way because they're all very handmade. But to communicate the idea of a hat, absolutely. Normally what I'll do is I'll, do, I'll sketch on paper. I just find that easier and then photograph it, bring up the contrast, you know, email it, text it, whatever. For me, sketching is something I do probably 20 times a day. It's how I communicate. If you're a journalist, you're on your laptop typing away. I, I sketch, that's how I communicate. And it's normally a very specific pencil, but on any old bit of paper. But, you know, I could draw in tomato ketchup if I had to. I mean, I'm sketching in my head all the time, 24 hours a day. But I normally write them down on a Sunday morning. On my sofa, at home, with a cup of coffee. And when I'm sort of half asleep, as soon as the consciousness comes into it, that's when the questioning of the possibilities of what it should or should not be like also come in as well. So a very pure and direct feeling I have first thing on a Sunday morning. Sometimes there are eureka moments in the bath. For me, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was the painter and saint of hats. And when I curated an exhibition at the V&A Museum a few years ago called Hats and Anthology by Stephen Jones, I really wanted to have the one of the Queen Mother's hats. We had something from the Queen as well. And um, all the Queen Mother's hats are kept at Buckingham Palace in storage. And it was actually the Queen who chose which hats of her mother's came to the exhibition. And it was the hat that she wore on her 100th birthday when the Queen gave her a telegram as being, congratulations, telegram for being 100 years old. And I think nothing could have meant more. And from the Queen herself, we had an Hermes scarf because I felt that the scarf was her ultimate hat. And I studied for weeks exactly how to knot it in a bow underneath the chin. And I think that was one of the greatest moments of my life. <laughs>